Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're opening the first action in summit here at GSA at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And it's funny to be in the setting because it's, uh, we really don't have one point to look at and that's part of what we're doing, decentralizing what it means to, to discuss together and how to do it in a way that is literally collective and bringing different voices together. The action in summits are following affirmations, the affirmation series that GSAP was hosting last year. Uh, and it's claiming the inseparability of discourse, practice, and activism. This is crucial for what the school uh, stands for. And it means that, that discourse, practice, and activism are not sequential, but mutually informing uh, and basically something that needs to be happening uh, simultaneously and, and interconnected. Uh, but also, uh, how basically uh, we action a change of paradigm is what we're discussing now. Uh, there's a consensus or a high level of consensus of a need of a change of paradigm from a culture and a way of constructing our societies and ecosystems based on extractivism, violence, and inequality to one that could be based on mutual care, fairness, and inclusivity. But how to do that? It's something that remains uh, under accounted, uh, how to do that through methodologies, through uh, techniques, through practices, through ways of doing, through sensitivities, through aesthetics. It's really what we're exploring now. And what we want to do is to acknowledge what are those practices, those knowledges, those methodological shifts that can allow us to pr pr participate and, and contribute to that change of paradigm. Uh, so we're thinking methodologically here in these eight uh, action in summits that are intended to action change. Uh, and we're doing it conversationally. We're not having a single discourse, a single experience, or a sort of a privileged one, but rather also celebrating that this is something that we have to do together and collectively. Uh, and that's why we wanted this first uh, uh, action in summit to be about collectiveness, what it takes, what it's needed, how difficult it is, but also how can it be achieved uh, to work collectively. And that's something, of course, that is a change, a huge change in the way uh, disciplines like architecture, like urban design, like uh, planning, uh, like uh, design at large work, in which, of course, there's a celebration of individuals, of authors, of solo authors, of masters, you name it. But of course, also a place where urban planning, urban design, architecture, and many other sister uh, disciplines have made very significant contributions. And in this room, there's uh, a lot of people that have been working on this transition into the collective uh, uh, way of thinking, their practices and their knowledge and their disciplines, and that's what makes this summit so e exciting, that we, we have this, this high accumulation of knowledge, experience, ideas, uh, sensitivities that can be now be connected through the summit. Uh, it's also important to say that the school is going through a process of decentering. As most the schools uh, like this in the world, uh, GSAP was mostly centered around architecture. And now we see that even to do interesting architecture, relevant architecture, it's very important to acknowledge the need for conversations across disciplines, and not only about uh, or among those of the built environment, but also with others across campus, across the world. And also not only disciplines, but also to build conversation between different ways of doing, of being, of existing. Uh, and those that come from the world of activism, uh, of uh, the world of, of being affected by, by things, as we all are, but some more than others and some different than others, but also even the more than human participations of, of tools, of technologies, of, of procedures, of regulations, of ideas, uh, of documents, and of course, of, of devices. I want to say also that um, that is really, we're, we're happy to have these conversations across time and geographies. Uh, there, those that are speaking today and here uh, are very much uh, connected to very specific contexts, local and transnational and translocal, uh, but definitely situating their practices in very specific realities and communities. Uh, but it's very important for us also to acknowledge that there's learnings that can happen when we share experiences across fields, across uh, uh, histories and across also specific communities and that's what the possibility of a discipline is about. So with that I want to uh, pass the, 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 the mic 
uh, to Barjan Polman, who's been curating these uh, summits, and we, we start. We will have a very tight uh, 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 procedure here and timing here so that we can have space for uh, contributions of everyone and dialogue, so write your questions and thoughts, and we can share them after the interventions of all the speakers. So good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome all of you to the very first uh, Actioning Summit. And I want to especially welcome our esteemed guests tonight. Uh, Superwood Boon, Maat Hatnakorn, uh, Alejandro Echeverri, um, Alison Martinez, and Shalina Odbert, um, and our respondents who are sitting in the middle, Erika Rami, uh, Kaya Kuhl, and Joseph Seal Henry. Um, and I want to watch everyone who's uh, watching, want to welcome everyone who's watching online, hopefully. Uh, I know there's normally many of you from around the planet and from multiple different time zones. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Bart-Jan Polman. I'm the director of exhibitions and public programming here at GSEP. And as many of you know, it was already said for some time, we've been rethinking uh, the format of the lecture series at the school, uh, both in its enactment, so to speak, and, and, and curatorially as well. So this led to affirmations last year, which brought together many, many incredible speakers, uh, such as Rob Nixon, Samia Henney, Olalikan Jefus, Elizabeth Povinelli, Jack Halberstam, Denise Ferrer de Seif, uh, De Silva, A.L. Weitzman, and many, many others, um, and put them together in dialogue with each other. And, and the audience here as well, and a planetary cohort of respondents um, that was constituted as part of this affirmations project. So what we're starting tonight with the Actioning Summits, it's not quite the same, uh, but it is in many ways uh, a continuation of the project. The next step, so to speak, uh, one that wants to, to continue to challenge both the existing formats and bring together a wide range uh, of voices and discuss together um, the built environment through numerous urgent topics that can all be seen as sort of overlapping, connected, intersected, etc. Um, and more specifically, um, what was uh, already said, what is aimed at with this actioning summit is to discuss the how. Uh, the how as in how to tackle these topics, which over the next eight months will include community engagement uh, tonight, affordable housing, AI, the scaling up of carbon sequestration, more than human intelligence, the bringing together of multiple forms of knowledge, uh, there will be a session on disability and one on, on reparations. Um, in other words, uh, what we want to discuss here is the very specific knowledge of all the speakers and methodologies that they, are, that they have used in, uh, in the incredible work uh, that, that led to or, or is leading to uh, some uh, amazing tangible results. Uh, and the format, the way we are, are sitting here, uh, surrounded by each other, the breaking of the fourth wall is a key part of this and, and built quite literally on, on affirmations as this setting was originally meant to be uh, an affirmations exhibition. Um, um, so, so just a, a few words on how the evening uh, will unfold. Uh, we will first hear um, from the four speakers, starting with Shalina Odbert, then Alison Martinez, then Superwood Bunmahat Hadnakorn, um, and lastly Alejandro Echeverri. Each will speak about 15 minutes on their incredible work uh, that is part of, of many different contexts. It also overlaps in many different ways. And we have MH sitting there who will raise a flag. Can you show the flag? I mean, when the 15 minutes are up, so that's a clear sort of sign that, that, that the time is almost up because as, as um, Andres mentioned, we're very strict with the time. Um, so after the, the four presentations, we will hear targeted questions from our interlocutors, um, starting with Joseph Seal Henry, then Kaya Kuhl, and then Erika. Avrami, and then we will open it up to conversation and questions. And I also want to, to strongly encourage the speakers, if you have questions for each other, also to, uh, to, to ask them. So our first speaker, I'm almost done, will be Shalina Odbert, um, the co-founder and executive director of the Conque Design Initiative, um, a nonprofit uh, that uses urban planning, landscape architecture, research, and community organizing to both the more just and public realm. Everyone, there's, there's many seats still here. So if you, if you want to find a seat, Please, please. Um, uh, straddling different disciplines, skills, and project type, her work um, is linked by a common purpose to build community power and ensure that where you live does not determine how you live. Um, we will then hear from Alison Martinez, a native Brooklynite and co-founder of Brooklyn Level Up, uh, which is a non-profit community development corporation maximizing BIPOC entrepreneurs' access to small business resources and seeking to build affordable residential, commercial, and community, um, communal spaces through its community land trust, and who is working to address environmental justice issues in Flatbush, East Flatbush, and Flatlands, Brooklyn. 
Uh, Dan from Thailand, uh, Superwood Boon Mahat Hadnakorn, uh, who is the co-founder of Jaibine Studio, uh, a design firm focusing on architecture, rewilding landscapes and placemaking. Um, Superwood worked at uh, the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights as a community architect and is a coordinator of the Community Architects Network, which is a regional network of architects, planners and academics working to support urban poor communities to acquire housing security and having housing policy through a participatory approach. And then lastly, we're incredibly excited to have the distinguished professor uh, in urbanism at TSA uh, Monterey University, Alejandro Echeverri here, who probably needs little introduction because we all know the important work he did in Medellin. Um, he's an architect, urbanist and academic who between 2004 and 2008 was director of the Urban Development Institute and director of urban projects in Medellin, where he led the social urbanism strategy to make the city a blueprint um, for the future of other distressed cities worldwide. And he's also an international consultant and advisor to UN Habitat and the World Bank, especially in countries with weak political uh, and institutional structures. Um, our first response then will be uh, by GSEP faculty Joseph Henry, who is a designer, urbanist and curator um, whose practice advocates for a more equitable built environment through policy and cultural production. Um, he recently co-curated the incredible uh, British Pavilion. I hope you had the chance to see it at the Venice Architecture Biennial um, and has worked for the mayor uh, of London in the Culture uh, and Creative Industries Unit. Kaya Kuhl um, is an urban designer and the founder of You Are the City, an urban research design and planning practice based in Brooklyn uh, that works with communities, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations to co create mission driven projects at multiple scales. And then, last but not least, is Erika Avrami, uh, a preservationist uh, and planner who is the James Marston Fitch Associate Professor of Historic Preservation here at Columbia GSEP, um, where she also directs the Urban Heritage, Sustainability, and Social Inclusion Initiative. So with that, um, the summit is officially open, and um, Shalina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean Jacques, Bart, and colleagues for the invitation to join this important discussion tonight. I love the format and everything that you've done to ensure a really rich dialogue tonight. I'd like to tell you a story this evening of building a park and building power. But before I do that, I'll take just a quick minute to introduce you to the firm. As Bart mentioned, KDI is a nonprofit design and community development practice focused on building what we call a more just public realm. We are an interdisciplinary team of planners, landscape architects, architects, and community organizers working in four offices across three countries and about a dozen other places in between. We work in four primary ways. We design and build those social amenities that are missing in a community. We also do the long-range planning needed to ensure that a community's future is inclusive. We oftentimes change policies standing in the way of equity in the public realm. And we conduct rigorous research and data collection to tell the full story of what's happening in a community to ensure that resources and political will flow more equitably to those places. Let's see, there we go. Our, wherever we work, our work is guided by three core principles. Uh, the first is participation. Our projects are done through a shared and iterative design and decision-making process with community members, and this is something that lasts through all phases of a project process. The other principles are networking and integration. Networking is the simple idea that one project, no matter how great it is, is never enough to address a problem at scale. And so we commit to a community or region over the long term to network interventions and shift those outcomes at the larger scales. And then integration is just the understanding that the challenges of justice in the public realm are intersectional, meaning that they aren't just design challenges. And so the intervention should be intersectional too. And to the extent possible, should design in layers of social and economic change as well. Okay, so the story I'd like to share tonight takes place in the Eastern Coachella Valley of California. 
This is a story about participation, but it's not your typical one. This is a story about our attempt to continue to critique our own work and to do better. It's a story about pushing ourselves to move up this well-known ladder of participation from partnership to that hard-to-reach spot of community engagement that is not just about information or even influence, but engagement that is really about the redistribution of power. This story takes place in the rural farm worker communities of the Eastern Coachella Valley, just miles away from venues like the Coachella Music Festival and next door to wealthy resort towns like Palm Springs. Different from neighboring Palm Springs in the Eastern Coachella Valley, tens of thousands of people, 40% of whom live under the poverty line, do not have access to adequate transportation. Their drinking water contains arsenic levels above the federal legal limits. Sanitation is largely unpermitted and dependent on aging septic systems. Insecure access to food is common, despite being a major agricultural producer for the state. And open space, despite the abundance of vacant land, is an afterthought. Housing stock is reliant on unpermitted and out-of-date mobile home parks. And this lack of infrastructural access is further exacerbated by temperatures that routinely reach over 110 degrees in the summer, combined with some of the highest rates of asthma in the state from poor air quality. Together, these issues of sanitation, lack of public space, and adequate potable water supplies mirror in many ways those seen in the informal settlements of Kenya, where our work as KDI first began. So one of the unincorporated communities of the East Valley is called Oasis. This is a community with gorgeous agriculture, landscape, and especially people. Before this project, there were no purpose-built parks or public spaces within a 20-minute drive of any of these communities. In 2018, we opened this five-acre park, with, uh, which celebrates in very big and small ways the predominantly Mexican immigrant community, culture, and, and surrounding landscape. Uh, we had just managed to do this project through organizing, advocacy, and fundraising, and it became the first park within a 20-mile radius in the neighboring community of North Shore. The idea was always, though, to uh, build a network and help other communities neighboring ad parks where they live. So residents about 10 minutes away in the community of Oasis were also advocating and organizing for a park for many years. And they asked us to partner with them. We then committed to doing that and bringing on the local parks district who had become a partner on that first park to fund, design, and build a park in Oasis. Like the first park in North Shore, we needed this to be a park that worked harder for the community than your average park with a playground. Because there were no other public amenities in Oasis, this park would have to serve as a place for recreation, civic engagement, and economic exchange, the idea of a productive public space. So a former school site was acquired, and KDI got to work planning the engagement process. Taking our experience from the North Shore Park, where residents were very active in shaping their park, we asked ourselves how this time around we could aim to not just share decision-making power with residents, but to build real community power along the way. So our idea was pretty simple. Rather than designing and implementing the engagement process ourselves, as we had done in North Shore, our first step would be to assemble a team of residents a youth street team, in this case, that could design the engagement process with us and lead the implementation with our support. They helped us define the big questions. What was it that we wanted to know about the community? How do residents see their community? And then they helped us figure out how we would gather information about that question. It was these first two early steps that we saw how transformative that simple move was. 
The questions we were asking were so much more nuanced than the ones we could have developed on our own. And thanks to the street team's knowledge of the community, we understood that in Oasis, asking people to come to a central location to engage, as we had before, would be a losing strategy. The street team had an idea for reaching people that was much better. They suggested that we reclaim a familiar object in Oasis, the shade trailer that's used by farm workers during breaks in the field, and reimagine it as a mobile research beacon. They created a list of things it should do, and we together co-designed it. And then it got out into the community, traveling all over, speaking to all kinds of people, asking residents to share their stories, to respond to surveys, to map the amenities in Oasis, and to take portraits to share with us and to take home to their families. When the beacon was done we, making its rounds, the street team and KDI shared back all that we had learned to make sure that we got it right at a fall fiesta in the community. At the fiesta, we then invited people to join us for the next phase of engagement, designing the park. Here, another engagement process co-led by our team and the street team. The street team hosted workshops at local schools, and the beacon hit the road again, collecting design ideas this time for the park. They also collected other needs that the park might be able to address through programming or amenities, and residents' first ideas at solutions for addressing these needs. Then multiple designs were created, with residents really dreaming big about what was possible. But then we asked the residents to do the hard work of melding dreams with constraints, making trade-offs through a participatory budgeting process. When residents were then given a park budget and real costs for the elements that they were considering. They ultimately got to a single design that would transform this 15-acre site in two phases into spaces like this, this. And then the first phase was born, with the um, simple sport field side of the park. And from the launch celebration onward, it was an immediate hit. So this on its own was a huge success story for the residents that had been demanding a park for over a decade. But as great as this phase one of the park is, if you ask me, the real success of this process were these folks, the Oasis Leadership Committee. The members of the Oasis Leadership Committee started simply as members of the community. If you remember, I mentioned that the goal of our engagement process was not just to build a park, but to build power. So the, throughout the process I just shared, we invited residents to self-identify if they wanted to get even more involved. And one by run, residents who were participating in workshops and other gatherings started to sign up. And then we began to help them organize and grow as leaders through trainings, exchange visits with other groups, and through an enterprise initiative. Through that entrepreneurship project, we helped them develop pitches for small businesses that might be able to take place within the park. And several women in the leadership group pitched the idea that a food cooperative could act as a concession stand. And with that, AMO was born. AMO went on to be the only local vendor at the Coachella Music Festival and continues to this day. The OASIS Leadership Committee also started hosting community events on their own, like this Children's Day event at the park. But that was really just the beginning for them. Since then, they've led the effort for multiple other change efforts, each time with less and less support from KDI, more and more of their own initiative, and more and more of their own base that they have built. They got involved in an environmental justice campaign we were a part of around air quality at the Salton Sea. They also took on the issue of shade because while there was finally an extension of the bus line to Oasis, the stops had no shelters or trees. 
and the waits in 100 plus degree weather were routinely over 30 minutes. They co-designed and piloted the shelter prototype that garnered the attention of all the local politicians, the news outlets, and the bus line itself who signed up to extend the pilot. And they simultaneously supported a major research effort led by K UCLA and KDI on heat impacts. And as the community engagement leads, they were compensated for this work as a group, uh, one of the first signs of their independence. And with the success of that project, KDI, UCLA, and the OASIS Leadership Committee applied as three independent partners for a grant to create a shade equity master plan for the region. We were successful, and that work is now underway with OLC members, OASIS Leadership Committee members taking part uh, in a UCLA class that's being taught at the same time. So eight years later, we see not just the power that they've built, but also the power that they've passed on to the next generation. The young man on the left was brought by his mom, an OASIS Leadership Committee member, to every event she attended. And today, he's a leader of our youth environmental justice group on the right, called Juntos. Here's another child of an OLC member who just finished a summer internship with KDI and is a student at UCLA uh, working with the research team on the Shade Equity Master Plan. And we've just invited a member of the o OASIS Leadership Committee to join the KDI board. There's a lot more I could say upon reflection about this group and this project, but I think that's the point of the ensuing discussion. So I'll stop here for now, and thank you for listening. Next is uh, Alison Martinez from Brooklyn Level Up. Hello, everyone. I'm Alison Martinez, and I am co-founder of Brooklyn Level Up. Our mission is to maximize access to build community wealth. We actually started in 2020 during the height of the pandemic. And what we decided is that we needed an opportunity and a space to really do some of the work that we couldn't do through our community board work. And that we needed to create a community development corporation that could really service the needs of East Flatbush, Flatbush, and Flatbush, Brooklyn. Our goal is to cultivate equity, wealth, and networks for people of color in particular. We're in a community that is um, basically surviving the ravages of gentrification, um, a lack of investment over time, and really is struggling in some ways to find its next steps. This is our team, small but mighty. Um, I am the CEO and executive director. I am also a practicing attorney and real estate broker. My fellow co-founder is Rachel Goodfriend, who is a real estate development consultant. And we have now have a pro programs coordinator, Yvette Mendez, who's a former teacher. What really bonds us all together is a commitment to the community that Yvette and I were born and raised in, and that Rachel has come in and raised a family in. So that is, I think, the nexus of really what brings us together in our strength is a real di diverse commitment to the community that we're in. So our work is divided into three initiatives. The first is our entrepreneurship collective. This actually is one of the projects that really started our work because during the pandemic, we had small businesses in our community, especially restaurants, which are the vast majority of small businesses in the area that were struggling to figure out how they would manage um, with the changes and social distancing and how they would be able to avoid violations and the like. And so what we did was to partner with our local community board, Community Board 17, to basically have reopening events. And we would take time to go listen to uh, city agency presentations and turn those that information into easily, easy clickable toolkits that small businesses could um, follow. We would go to their businesses and help them basically perform a site audit to make sure that they were in in alignment and basically able to comply with the rules and regulations. And then from that, we would work with them to host like vax and relax events, going to spaces like restaurants and being able to have community members come 
there to trusted spaces to get tested, to get vaccines, and also to get information about other things. Sometimes you have to reach people where they are. So that would mean we would also provide housing and entrepreneurship information at that same event. Or at one of the re local restaurants, Suede had a party for the year, so, and so we said, okay, you're having a party and we know people are going to come out for that. So we set a table to do entrepreneurship training and housing support at the party. And that you'd be surprised that if you can find the spaces that people are already going to be, that you can actually flood them with additional information. And that's kind of what has really prompted our work through our um, entrepreneurship collective, which has now partnered with our local library to create a small business incubator where we are really just trying to support small businesses, especially um, aspiring entrepreneurs, to really figure out what they need to do, have access to trusted resources, and give them a support that they need to actually build new businesses in our community. We recognize the value of small business as one of the main ways to contain and preserve culture. This is a highly Caribbean culture and community. And you see that through who owns businesses and really maintaining access to ethnic food, um, other resources, and opportunities. That also means that we will do things such as like host small business movie nights. Most movie nights in our community and maybe where you live as well will basically cater to children. But we said, what if we had one that actually showed a movie about collective um, banking and we showed the banker, and we also had resources there for small businesses. What if we did something that would provide a space for people to learn and get information and in easier, more accessible ways? And movies are often some of the easiest ways to do that. So again, some of our work, we create toolkits and just different cultured events that resonate with our community. In addition, one of our second initiative and our biggest work actually is our community land trust work. As I said, East Flatbush in particular is um, a highly Caribbean community that is subject to gentrification. And by the same time, it's actually one of the last bastions of black home ownership in New York City. However, we are losing um, rates of black home ownership by like about 10% thus far. So what we're trying to do is work collectively with residents, um, this community people who are interested, also the um, technical support, and gathering with other organizations and CLTs around the city through organizations like Nicely, which is the coalition of all of the New York City community land trusts, to find ways to preserve affordable housing, commercial space, community space in our area. In particular, what we're trying to do, because we don't have a lot of public land to leverage, we are working with um, seniors who tend to be homeowners to figure out how could we actually have properties that could be deeded um, to the land trust. What are the other ways that we can leverage opportunities, especially in the environmental justice space, to use those available funds to acquire properties in our community? So this is some of what we hope will be our most lasting work. It also stems with working with a lot of tenants associations in our area so that we are basically helping them to prepare for what it will be to turn um, from a tenant model into home ownership. So we do a lot of training with that, as well as host community dinners. Community dinners allow us to work with uh, professionals to come in and help us help the community tell its story to figure out what's important to it, what are the values that we have, what is it that we need to preserve? But also to recognize the reality is we do need development, but we need a development that's centered around the residents who already live in the community and have hopes and dreams that they'd like to see come to pass. And that has been some of the challenge, but also the opportunity is to get people to get past their own barriers and fears of what they've already experienced to see what is possible if we are building relationships and working together to build and preserve space. On that bottom part there, and just another part of space that's important to um, claim and reflect on, is we actually discovered there's a, in the Flappish African burial ground in our community. It was actually slated to become further desecrated, although it has been over years. It actually had a landmark building on it that was 
allowed to, go, to fall into such disrepair that it was um, torn down and the city was going to put an affordable housing property there. However, we were able to co work with other organizations and community residents, churches, activists and artists, and everyday people in the community to actually save that property so that it will become a park for actually telling the story and resilience of the formerly enslaved that used to, that were buried there. And then lastly, our third initiative, this is our newest one, is called Brooklyn Love Love Cultivate. This is actually born from the work that we've done collectively with schools to provide um, studio resources and internship time to help us learn about our community. Um, you can grow up in a community and not know, obviously, everything about it, but because other people have given their time to study and to share with us resources and information, that's how we found out that East Flatbush is actually the third, has the third highest amount of lead in its soil. And because of that, the, and I told you before that it also is one of the last batches of black home ownership, people take pride in growing food in that soil. Unfortunately, that soil may not actually be safe because the level where lead stays in soil is also the level where um, lettuce and other root vegetables grow. So we launched this past summer a youth um, paid internship that would help young people get exposed to green economy jobs and be able to go around to different homes in our community, test that soil, and then we're working with Brooklyn College's Urban Soil Lab to test that soil and let homeowners know, hey, actually this is the lead content and actually the complete nutrient profile of your land and what you're growing in. We have, are starting to get the results. Unfortunately, every property thus far, and we've tested over 75 homes, have at the very least moderate levels of lead contamination. Um, so we're now working to figure out what the response will be to that and what we will do. But because of that work, we are allowing young people to get engaged in what's important in their future, thinking about how we can share home ownership issues with, with residents because we have a foray into them by testing and providing a, a resource we are able to then also collect stories from them, from those homeowners who we learn things about what is typically grown across our, our neighborhood where people have like basically a completely hidden story in their backyards that you don't get to see. But, and also getting to see shared history about like how through growing you can tell, you know, people how they were, cultures were shared or intermingled in diversity of, by marriage growing things that would not necessarily be part of your initial culture, but now become part of a staple of what you grow. And from that, we are now working to get our first property, which would be a community resilience hub. East Flatbush in particular has um, the, it suffers from extreme heat, but also has the fewest amount of cooling sensors. This space that we are contemplating creating if we get this grant that we've been working on, would actually provide a cooling space, but also space for people to do um, community land trust building, community gathering, and the like. So how do we work? For us, what we've learned is that we are nothing without our partnerships. We cannot, we're one small organization, we're small, we have interns, we have volunteers, but it is, because we're able to be in a position of deep relationship with our community residents, black associations, the community boards, um, just regular everyday people who are the point and resource on their block. Because we're able to be in relationship with them, we have their trust, then it's easier for us to bring in the other partnerships that we've built over time through working with academic institutions at all levels, where we get interns, where we get to also have opportunities um, to get data and reports that we wouldn't be able to get on our own. In fact, like I would take a point of pride with, we've worked with Pratt to do land, um, land studies, which is how we ended up getting to know about the lead content in our soil, but working with GSAP and Adam Lubinsky and his class, who's here, who 
helped us to work on getting reports on how our community was impacted or could be impacted by pro projects and policies like City of Yes and creating together um, an accessory dwelling unit toolkit that would help residents in our community know how, if they were to actually create a an AD on their property, what that could consist of, what the cost could be, and to be able to have some sense of understanding of what the changes in policy could be and how they could affect them. But building these relationships is pivotal to us actually being able to make the changes that we hope to see in our community over time. We can't do any of this work alone, but by working with students, we're also helping them to understand the value of speaking to hyper-local people who have lived experience that's of value. Being able to collect that data and then make a difference in what policies they might implement or who they may decide as elected officials or other city agencies to bring to the table so that we can actually help communities decide what their values are, what the needs are, and how we can collectively bring about the changes that they hope to see without feeling that fear that change means that they will be displaced. So it's a constant um, reflection on how we can build trust over time. So tools of engagement. Visioning sessions for us are really key. This is how we use art and technology to be able to help people really share um, what's important to them, what they would like to see in a space. We have worked with artists to create um, collaging toolkits that have pieces that allow people to create art that say, if I design the park or the burial ground, these are the elements that are important to me. And then they get to take that frame of that art home with them, reflect, and then report back. So we do, we do the regular standard surveys and the like, but we find that we really get to have a sense of people really feeling included and understood and connect with like, their emotions on space by doing, using art. We do a story collection. It's usually about hear a Brooklyn story, tell a Brooklyn story, we collect them. Um, and this is the way that we've especially been able to create intergenerational work with seniors and young people in our community to be able to share and stories about what used to be in a space, what they remember, and then also what the hopes and visions are for the future spaces that are there. Um, we do community report backs. It's important that you're not just taking information from communities, but you make a pointed um, effort to report back what you heard from them, making sure that you get it right, and make sure that it's a consistent and constant communication over time. We create explainer flyers for every, especially zoning changes, um, the Interborough Express, anything that would actually affect um, the lived ex spaces in our community so that, because most people are not going to go to the website, they don't know the project exists, we have to bring that information to them in accessible ways. We also create videos where it's not just, here's a rendering of what it looks like of DCP. We take videos exactly of what that R4 looks like in East Flatbush so that you can have a real sense of it. And we're building a community mapping tool that also collects recipes, um, videos and stories and music to help people place themselves and show us what the values are in the community. And that is something we're releasing soon. And then lastly, we have community walking tours, which are also essential for us to help show existing conditions, which we help black associations use them to basically work with city agencies to show them exactly where the problems are. And then we help them with rezoning walking tours, even with CB17, which is undergoing a plan for that as well. But this is really like the ethos and the work of what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, next up is Superwood Boon Mahat Hanakorn. Okay, uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I feel really happy to be here to share and learn from you. Um, today, I'm going to share you about the process of design with people. I would like to take a case, uh, just one case from Myanmar that I and team work with to explain about how people uh, housing can extend to the citywide development. Um, first, I would like to uh, introduce our 
uh, our team. Uh, I have uh, my own studio in the northern part of Thailand called Jai Ban Studio. Uh, it is an architecture firm to the architecture and landscape uh, with the concept of design with nature. And another part of my work is the uh, community architects uh, and co-founder at uh, Community Architects Network support Asian Coalition for Housing Rights. This is a network of uh, architects who live in Asia and want to support the people housing process in Asia. And uh, uh, before I begin the, the, the story of the project, I would like to introduce, this is the, the, the program that we used to work uh, in the Asia uh, at 2009 and to 2014. We got uh, a fund from Gate Foundation try to create a model to solve the housing problem because of in the Asia, especially in the, in the Southeast Asia, uh, we, some countries that haven't had the housing policy yet. So we try to work with people how to create the model by the people power. So this is the motto that we believe, uh, how to let people be the solution because of people they're housing themselves every day, how to work with that power to create the scale. Uh, yes, you see, you see the number of the, the city and uh, the project we've been doing in five years. And the case that I would like to, to share you today is uh, from the Myanmar. Uh, it started uh, start by the 2010, but before that, in the 2008, uh, the Myanmar, they hit by the cyclone crisis, the southern part of, of Myanmar. They are the most of the house and the land and the farmland was uh, destroyed by the heavy cyclone. And uh, eight, eight, uh, 81,000 family become the homeless. Uh, then the, the, the housing problem are serious. And at uh, 2010, we start to visit the Myanmar after two years. And we see uh, this uh, situation, uh, the people from the rural or the a uh, precinct land of the urban area uh, uh, house themselves in the in the government land or the private land uh, with uh, unhealthy condition because they lost all the house, lost all the farm, lost all the job. And, and at the time, the city, the Yangon city are uh, starting to urbanize. So they uh, pull the people by uh, the job and uh, the service sector that need from the people. So that's why the rural people start live in, in the urban area, uh, to squat in, the, in this land. And this is the, the, the work that they, uh, for the daily life, uh, they work as a label uh, in the hotel, some part is the service sector in the, in the market or uh, the, the tea shops. So uh, the process begin with uh, the local NGO that become our network at SCHR. It's called Women for the World. Uh, this uh, local NGO, they work uh, with the women group to create the women saving groups to uh, acquire the land and housing. And the, that condition, uh, I would like to say that the condition of work that time is uh, the Myanmar have not get the erection. So we have to sneak uh, in, 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 that, uh, in that country and we just have to work for three days because of at a time if you gathering the people more than nine to five, uh, they will suspect you do, doing something. So uh, we, this is the first day we visit the communities and get to know the, the women groups and listen from their, what they had been doing and and they share us the, the, the plot of the map that they want to uh, acquire for the land, for the, making the first housing projects by the people. So uh, the process begin, uh, we introduce ourselves that we are not here to, to give you uh, anything or the housing solution because um, how can I say, uh, I want, I don't want to uh, I want to create, uh, empower the people, not just make the people be the recipient from some uh, donor. So uh, instead of uh, uh, introduce what we had been knowing, we ask them to interview, ask them to interview, ask them to uh, 
explain what they have been doing so far. And the right hand side, use, uh, they, they put uh, the information of the saving amount of each group that they have been saving. It's very interesting because of, uh, at the time we, we speak a different language and they're not speaking Thai and we cannot speak Myanmar and they come from many community that have heard that the first housing project will be come. So they divide the small group, put the numbers uh, of family members and amounts. And that's, this is the, the beginning of the process that we uh, understand them that they had the money uh, collectively and with the, their own groups that they can trust each other. So uh, we give uh, the people and ask them to draw what is the house uh, look like for, 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 for themselves. And first they are reluctant to draw because of uh, it's quite awkward that uh, we came here not to, to give anything so I ask them to, 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 to draw the house instead of us to draw from them. But luckily there are one boy uh, break the ice, they draw the house, and once they, they, the boy does uh, starting to uh, draw the house, and they are the intervention of the young, the old lady that, you should do it like that, you should do it like that. <laughs> and the other group get inspired and start to draw their own house. And, and the man group, very interesting, they draw the plot of the land that they're looking for. Uh, to, to buy it and start to know how to lay out uh, the, the plot equally according to the number of the people to need the house. And uh, by this uh, drawing and open the space for the people to, to explain themselves, explain about their dreams, we get to understand uh, really quick information from them that and they, are, they are quality, uh, plot of land available. Even there are private land or the uh, public land, but they search the information. And the women draw the, the house that explain really delicate detail. How do they uh, use the house, what, what kind of space they need, and what the culture believe that are hidden in the house. And this is uh, the picture that uh, they explain the house that we can read uh, from the picture. It's very interesting. Uh, because they, they, they mentioned that they, uh, they need a steel house because of, during the monsoon, they had a heavy flood. They need a big tree because of uh, during the summer, it's very super hot and they need a water uh, pump to use. And importantly, they need separate toilet. And really important, they need a big shed that nearby the toilet. And this is the, the house, the, the beautiful house that they draw and for us, uh, just half a day, we get the, 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 the components of the house and living thing that they explain to us. And uh, the half of the day, uh, we get, uh, we, uh, we let the people to, uh, we, we, we throw the question, how you live together? How do they live together? This is the first plan that uh, they draw. They, they cut the paper. And, and try to make a layout, simple layout. And we ask the question that if you do the layouts like this, you need a lot of the, of the land because of, uh, to, to get the, the more land, you have to pay more. You have, and the, your money is perhaps is not uh, sufficient. So, and the second plan that they work together is like this. Yeah, to minimize the land but they start discuss among themselves, and if uh, the house uh, connected the road, the house is uh, get the benefit from the small economics. But the house in the back nearby the stream perhaps not get anything. It's not fair. Yeah, the, the dialogue among the people start uh, uh, start uh, discuss among themselves, and later on the final plan that they uh, make a layout like this and everyone seemed to be happy because of uh, uh, most of the house uh, connect with the small lane and the small lane connect with the big road yeah and because uh, connect the big road they get uh, benefit from to open the tea shop 
open the tobacco shops. This is seem to be that uh, the planning that everyone happy by the layout themselves and we just uh, support them, facilitate the process, ask the question and let them ask the question among themselves. And very interesting, really chaos <laughs> process because of we uh, uh, try to try to make the people, make the women group to understand how, how the planning relate for them and relate with their saving. And they discussed really interestingly about the widening, uh, the width of the road, how many feet it should be and how big it should be about the plot. And uh, on the side, we also, luckily we, we brought the measuring tape with us and they play with the measuring tape and to visualize this is the plot of the house according the initially discussion is too big. So after seeing this, they minimize the plot site. Yeah, and by discussion uh, with, the, with the man who know the cost of construction and, we, and with this planning, we try to calculate how much for overall cost that it, it will be happen. Yeah, and the next day, the next day after we did get the, the basic idea of how the plot it uh, look like. And the second day, we, we asked them to cut the model to, to, uh, to explain with this side of the land how you live together and how you put uh, everyone how together. The interesting uh, that we learned from the people uh, there is the, if you remember, this is the big road, this is the small lane, and this is the canal backside. When they put the, the house, uh, they will put a tree in front of the small lane, and they want to open the, the small shop in front of the house. And in the back lane, they put the toilet, as they used to draw to us before, and they will put a garden bed and the pig shed uh, in, uh, back in the back lane. And they explained to us that they would put uh, the toilet and the pig shed in the back lane because of they want to share the septic tank. Otherwise, if, if every house have the septic tank, it's costly. So it, it means six house, they have just only one septic tank. This is the, the very creative way that we, that we learn from the people there. And uh, in the second days, it seemed like uh, the energy of the people are brightened up instead of uh, being the recipient and waiting for some architect to help them. And they feel they, they design the house by their own with a little help of us. <laughs> uh, and this is a group pictures before um, the police came. <laughs> Actually, the police came in the second day. <laughs> and uh, on the last day, we tried to visualize, make, make the model, and to uh, give the people uh, uh, before we go back uh, with the cut model really fast. But for the people there, they seem, oh, sorry. Oh, it's excellent. They seem unhappy because they ask the color of the house. <laughs> it will be white. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we asked the, the local artists in the market to, to, to share, uh, to draw. And we helped to do the sketch up to uh, calculate the amount. And, and uh, before the, the construction begin, we try to set up the city fund because of not only the one community need a house, there are a lot of communities and we have the limited budget. The idea is we put the money in the center and women's saving group, they have to save. And after they get the fund, they have to pay back in the five years. So this fund will be a revolving fund to help the other. And to stimulate the network of the women's saving group to our the Yankon, uh, we do the citywide mapping survey, the land, the plot of the land and evict communities and all the process is uh, done by the women and architect volunteer uh, at the time. And we try to, before the construction, we try to, uh, to uh, make the people, women understand the housing design because uh, not just only the one village, yeah, the other have to understand and work with the local carpenter and the women uh, how to manage uh, the budget and 
this is the, the saving, the women's saving group that they put the money together. Yeah, and the process starting on to uh, buy the raw material and make by their own. And some community haven't have the, got the fund yet because of revolving fund not come back to them. They start to uh, searching for land and prepare the land. Yeah, and after a few months, after uh, the money passed to them, they make this house. Initially, the house is, uh, we set the budget uh, about uh, the 5,000 per unit, but the way they manage the cost is a three, three, 300, 300 uh, USD for per unit. Uh, the interestingly, uh, because of the pig check, because of the uh, get the small pig and they get the free food from the restaurant that they work for six months, it will create uh, 10 times uh, of the money they invest. And this, the, this uh, financial model uh, help them to, to get the, the house. And just not more than five years, just three years, they can uh, pay back uh, uh, the money to help the other. This is the one year after complete. I go really, really quickly. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we can, we'll, we'll continue this yeah, during yeah, the, yeah. the conversation. Sorry. This is, thank you for sharing this. And then lastly, um, Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you for, for the invitation to the school, Andres and, and Bart. So I will share some some ideas um, after we developed this process many years ago, 20 years ago. So I will show briefly a short images of the process of Medellin in the north zone of Medellin. And then I will, I will move to, to the work that we are doing in our lab in Medellin and some uh, uh, idea in Mexico as well. So um, this process, uh, we have been working in Medellin, and me personally, and different groups, and we have been working with the major in two, between 2004 and 2012. And we developed this idea of uh, urban integral projects and social urbanism uh, responding to the crisis that we have uh, many years ago. 25, 30 years ago, Medellin was lose the the public space, the public realm. We couldn't meet outside of our houses. And, and the city was very segregated, combining with violence and poverty and so on. So our focus at that time was how to reconnect some critical areas, like the image in the left, the Comuna 13, working with local processes. I will talk about it, but of how you see with social infrastructures public transport systems, mostly in those yellow lines that we are, have many in our cities that physically and, uh, and not physical uh, yellow lines that uh, uh, broke uh, a lot of enclaves and so on. So we developed very complex processes and pilot projects in some informal areas uh, with risk management like a creek and and irregular tenancy, informal as well, so, so was really complex. I am not going to explain the process, but it was an holistic approach that, that combines local resources, national resources, housing from environment and infrastructure. We combine in a complex processes the tenancy, working with lawyers and public transport systems and so on. So this happens between 2004 and 2012. A lot of people have been working in those projects in, in the city, and, and we learn a lot. And uh, after 15 years, we have some different perspective of some of them. But when we finish, and I finished in two, 2010, we were looking to, to how to create, how to found an urban lab from the university, from some uh, partnerships that could connect uh, local capacity, action, government, and learning processes as well. So we at the University of Afiti, Medellin, we found Urbam with M at the end, 
uh, in Spanish is Medio Ambiente, is Urban and Environment. And of course, working with people because from the process of Medellin, one thing that we learn, learn that to have sustainability and organic uh, sustainability in time was completely necessary, the local capacity, the local partnerships, the local forces, and how to develop and design a more uh, robust and, and uh, rich uh, engagement from the beginning. Some three ideas that we have been working in Urbam, not only, but for us was very important from this lab. Uh, the role of the universities and the role of these labs we call ethics in to have con a continued question in some specific territories and places and trying to, to produce dialogues, produce action, produce pedagogy processes in those territories with the people, local people. So the margin in the global south is not the margin. It's the, 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 the big challenge that we have today. So it's, I wrote here, here the margin, but it's in question mark. So we, one thing that, one example is from, from the, the learning process of Medellin, one thing that is a challenge, is still, is still be a challenge today, is the border. How we could work in the upper part where the informal, active informal occupation is happening. So this question of trying to keep a, a Urbam and our team and our dialogue in those uh, specific challenges is really important because the lack of uh, continuity in the uh, Global South and Latin American governments is like a tragedy. So we thought that the university is a key institution or those labs to, to keep the ideas and processes that continue, not only in, in learning uh, with the learning uh, challenge, but as well uh, to keep the public debate and public uh, processes uh, in, in this uh, direction. So we, we developed this uh, process for, we, it, it still be active, active for 12 years. Uh, but uh, 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 in, 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 this, uh, in this upper part of the, of the city of Medellin. So for us, it was very important to develop an alternative a, uh, agenda that is completely different than the government because the traditional uh, urban plans draw a line in the, in, the, in, the up, in, the, in the periphery of the cities and supposed to be the end of the occupation. But the informal forces, the displacement, the complexity, the illegality uh, works different. So we thought that has to work with community, with local knowledge, with uh, with uh, different solutions that the people could activate, combining with technology as well. So I am not going to explain this process. We could share those documents to, to you. Uh, but for us, it was really important to innovate, innovate and to change the paradigm of, of risk, combining the local history of risk that is completely different from our perspective of risk, how you could develop the, this process. But from this uh, learning from Medellin and the periphery and so on. So we are working in different areas in Colombia and rural areas that are completely different. <clears throat> but one thing that we learn is the, this sensibility and capacity first to build dialogues to allow us to understand first very different realities. And from those realities only to start to develop a, a more, I don't know, more, uh, not human, but more sensible perspective to help the government to connect with local initiatives. So one, th one thing that we end, this work we end uh, uh, one year ago, we have been working with the state and trying to develop an alternative approach from this river, Atrato River, that is located in the jungle that connects South America, Colombia, with Panama. Uh, there is no connection between South America and Central America. This is an amazing jungle, but a lot, with a, a lot of problems. So we, our idea was to 
develop in this basin of the river, not only the main river, all the affluents. We have been navigating and working for a year and a half, building some dialogues with different actors. And because the approach from the government always uh, came from the center of the country with very, very far uh, politics and programs. So we wanted to develop an alternative agenda, or at least to start a dialogue that could build an alternative agenda and information in this, in this, in this uh, area. So when you uh, go there, you find that in the main axis, uh, there is the Afro community of Colombia. The, in, the, in the 100 and 200 years ago, the slavery happens in Colombia as well, and most of the Afro communities uh, went to this, this area. But in the affluence, the small rivers are located the indigenous communities today. And when you work and you talk with them, the, the way that they explain their life is uh, drawing precisely the river and the affluence and tell the history how it happens in, with the kids and so on. So I am not going to explain the strategy and the document and the process, but the thing that we wanted is to develop an agenda that could uh, map the, a lot of uh, small local initiatives trying to connect and doing a partnerships with different organizations. Uh, it's not an official approach, but to, to create or to start to create an a, a organic partnerships that could help not only to understand, but only to start some uh, transformation there. That is a very, very complex uh, uh, reality. The, there is a illegality, violence, minority, extraction, and so on. So this idea of empathy for us is, is, really, uh, is really, I think, the key of the processes. And we, le we learn in Medellin, in the process, in the government before, that to, to develop a, a, not only the engagement, but the capacity to keep the programs alive it has to be with, to develop trust, to, to develop dialogues, to break the paradigms and that we have, because we have different realities, very different realities, and to, to, to increase and to support the local capacity. So in our center, we have a, a beautiful programs uh, of grants and partnerships, and we uh, invite uh, different leaders that we met before and we are meeting today, uh, we, uh, they, uh, we, they enter to our, our master programs, but they enter as well to collaborate, to collaborate with us in the processes and projects. Um, and the most important is that we develop a friendship with them. This is Cielo Olguin. She was part of this public project that transformed this uh, old, uh, how do you say, basurero, uh, garb garbage, uh, Field, land, land, field. Okay, and uh, in a very complex process in Moravia in Medellin, that uh, with working with with uh, the community and the moms in Moravia, they cultivate this hill, cultivate this hill, and Cielo learning this process entered to our program. Uh, is a professor today of some of our processes as well and programs, and she is leading the Urban Oasis Initiative that is amazing. So we increase this capacity of partnerships with, in the territory that is very important. We have many different histories. This is in Spanish. The, we have a podcast in, in our center. And this is another history that uh, Elaka, that is a leader from the Comuna 13, has uh, Agroarte. This is an initiative that they, he worked and they work for the memory of the place, cultivating uh, flowers and gardening. And uh, he entered in our program. We developed different processes together. And uh, in uh, the, the research uh, final uh, work, he, they did with Santiago uh, um, um, 
Santiago Londoño. <laughs> He's a very friend of mine, and I forgot the name, okay. Which, <laughs> I hope he's not in the video, of course. <laughs> so Santiago, Santiago Londoño was a government secretary of uh, Sergio Fajardo when he was uh, the state uh, governor. So we're trying to, to, to build those unexpected matches of work. And they are doing, after they, they finish uh, our uh, master program, they are doing an amazing platform that build trust from the local reality in the barrios with some uh, companies and foundations and uh, initiatives. So this, this podcast explain, and we have a dialogue that explain, explain this, uh, this program. The third idea that I, I already explained is that we understand now that our capacity of mediate and our capacity to build other leaders that could mediate in the process is really important is, and is key, a key issue. So Fernando Zapata has been a, one of the leaders that from the beginning we have been working with him and he, wa he, he, he was again, again, again us, again us uh, in uh, the, this uh, shifting ground process when we start. But we developed with different workshops, local workshops, and imaginary workshops, and so on, different, different methodology. We develop some kind of trust with him, and he entered to work with us in Urbam, then uh, did the master as well. And uh, Fernando now is leading many different uh, uh, beautiful processes. They built a school of, of how to manage risk in the hillsides, learning from the learning process that we built in this uh, rehabilitation and shifting ground was really powerful. And the most important for us was not the technical solution at that time, was how this process became a pedagogy process that has externalities uh, that we never expect from the beginning. So to, to finish, now I am working in Mexico in the Tecnologic of Monterrey. Uh, is a, 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 uni, a university that has, has presence in all the country. I am I belong to the School of Architecture and the Center for the Future of Cities. Uh, we are trying to develop this uh, city science capacity that is really powerful there but trying to connect with uh, social justice uh, action, uh, climate action, and local realities. And we and the university is really connected with the territories since many years ago. So I finish with this image um, that, um, that is happening today. We, we print and we publish this book and uh, arrive today to Medellin. Ciudad Sin Muros, city, open city, or city without, without walls. In this book, we're trying to share some of the processes that happen in the shadow, be, in, related with leaderships, related with a cultural approach, related with urban issues and urban processes, and, and so on. But uh, it's happening this week in this place. And this place is one of the areas that are more active today in Medellin that connect the informal areas to the north with the public transport system, with the science museum. And one thing that is really beautiful, and we have been working for many years in Medellin, is design events, design active events. So we, did, we changed the idea of the books fair that is happening this week. Uh, we, we found and we designed the um, fest of books that is open, they open different centers in the Moravia Cultural Center that is not in the image, the Explora Museum, the Botanical Garden or Child Hall, and there is the, the other places in the area. And there is a public conversation that, that links the different institutions, but the local communities and the different uh, uh, population of Medellin. So those is, are some ideas and processes that I wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
everyone. Um, I would now like to open it up uh, to questions from our respondents. Joseph, unfortunately, has to had to catch a, a train, but Kaya, if you want to ask the first question. First question. So um, thank you all for for these wonderful presentations and the diversity of scales. And but I also think a lot of uh, similarities and processes. Um, one thing that um, I asked myself uh, coming here already, and, and some of you touched on this a little bit, but I would love to hear, um, hear you speak about challenges um, in the way you account for the um, knowledge and capacity that uh, communities uh, bring to these processes. And I know Chalita mentioned um, compensation um, for the leadership uh, committee that you formed, but I'm curious um, how you navigate these imbalances that you come in as often paid experts, um, and a lot of community members are volunteering essentially a lot of time and their expertise, and so maybe you can give some examples of how you navigate this. Since you were mentioned, do you want okay. to, to begin? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. I think it's one that we talk about a lot, and as our work has grown and evolved, so has the way we um, approach this question. I, in the earliest days of our work, um, actually, our very we it wasn't KDI wasn't even a real thing yet. It was a student project uh, with a group of friends, the GSD. And we went for two weeks to Nairobi, and we're in an informal settlement there, uh, trying to talk to community members. And so really from day one, we were told very directly that our approach was terrible. Our resident said to us, um, why would we spend two weeks talking to you when we have two weeks worth of work to do? And and by the way, you're not the first group that's come through here asking to get our information. So I think it was great that that's what we learned from day one because we've never taken that for granted um, and always you know, had a really, been able to have these really frank dialogues around uh, what is our knowledge and how is it valued and how do we ensure that um, the knowledge that, we, that is essential to doing our work especially is valued in the same way. So all of that backstory to say um, compensation is one piece of it, but like the story that I shared today, we feel like the best starting point is to ask the community partner um, how they want to be compensated or how they want to engage in the work. And when we do that, I think the the answers vary. Sometimes there, it, and it depends on the scale of the project and the scale of involvement. So sometimes when there's something um, kind of like a one-time engagement or a series of one-time engagements, uh, community partners feel like that is just part of civic engagement and, and something that people want to volunteer to do. And then in other ways where we build these much more elaborate um, groups that can help share decision-making power in real ways, they have to be engaged in the same way that we are, which is, you know, nearly full-time or part-time, and so then there are different ways that residents want to be compensated for that, whether it's financially or through some other form of support or exchange. So I would say the simple answer to your question in our practice is that it, it's not one-size-fits-all, but where we start is by asking the partner um, how they want us to value the work and try to move forward from there. So, but do you want to respond? I'm curious with the community architect network, how that yeah, works? For yeah, example. I think the, the challenge one is how to you work with the boss of the people network because uh, as you are an architect, you have uh, the thing that you want to see completely, holistically. But when you work in the people side to get into the scale, how you deal with that because of the people or uh, scale uh, in, in, the, in the larger scale is uh, become the politic. They use the, the people power to negotiate the land, to negotiate the, the budget from the government to support. But it's, sometimes it uh, go really fast and go really, uh, really sneaky way. 
and how we balance between the, 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 the people power and uh, the, um, the standardized that we need as an architect to see things holistically. I think this is the, how, how the process to balance this. Yeah. I would say it does vary from project to project. We have some where it's a Metro card and then up to it's a $500 um, gift card. And it depends on the number or in the series of work if they are able to help us gather other information from other people who trust them and build our networks of access. But I do notice that in the philanthropic world and just even with some of our city contracts, they now expect you to build that into your costs, that you're going to have to compensate people for their time as they should be compensated for their time because they're bringing um, an expertise of lived experience that you don't have that they do. <laughs> so. So um, in general, in thinking in general, uh, for me, it's still be a challenge, a, a very obvious and, and simple concept that is the concept of equity and in, uh, inclusion. It's, it's really strange that uh, when you are, for example, in the cities of Colombia or the cities in Mexico, that is uh, and exceptional conditions, those uh, governments, cities, even institutions and universities that keep, keep the main agenda in the main problems. So to, to help to keep these questions on the table for us is, is really important, and the role of universities in Latin America is really important for that, too. And, um, and saying that the continuity as well is really a you could innovate the continuity and how to scale, scale the pilots and the local initiatives that could produce a, a, a not big transformation, but a transformation that could help in, 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 a, in, in a real, in the real, uh, with the real uh, dimension and size of the problem. So this, this uh, challenge of continuity is is not, doesn't belong to the government. Um, um, Desafortunadamente. Um, Unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> uh, has to be, but never happens generally. So how to keep the continuity in different scales, conversation and process is really important. And how to bring, break the paradigms be, 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 uh, from our reality, because, for example, I, I belong to a family that we have possibilities to study. I study in Colombian outside and have different opportunities, but the 50 or the 60 percent of the population has completely different conditions, and the 30 percent of the population that I show as well, and we have been seeing today, has completely completely different histories. So the paradigms are really different. When we talk about risk in this upper part of the informal areas of the Valley of Medellin, from the people that live there are not risk. They survive and they work with the risk and so on. And the technique and the people that develop strategies and, uh, and solutions. Uh, so how to, to build these horizontal dialogues that we could uh, increase and learn from the local intelligence, and we have this uh, modest, not, I, don't, I don't say if the right word is modest, but the different attitude to develop processes that could, has more porosity and could a more dynamic that we could uh, adapt and change with the reality, I think is really important. <clears throat> Thank you. Erica, please. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been so inspirational to hear about the ways in which you're all really activating more just processes around design and spatial production uh, through participatory research, shared decision making, co-production of knowledge, and the co-design of projects. But I think we would all agree that just processes do not always ensure just outcomes. And so I'd like to ask you to comment on 
how you've worked to evaluate the outcomes of your projects and their effects on publics and environments over time. Like how have lives and environments been improved? How have benefits been distributed across spaces and populations? And what are some of the unintended consequences that you didn't think about at the beginning of some of these processes, but that were outcomes in the end? Uh, so that we can really think about that critical relationship between process and outcome and how both can, can become more just. Alison, since in many ways you are the most, <laughs> like your project sure. is the most new, would you want to Yeah, um, these are some of the challenges that we're thinking through right now because it's that challenge between we have, like collectively, we have a vision for what we'd like to see in the community, but does that always match with what the community thinks are the important priorities. And that may not always be the case, it, but we also feel like sometimes we're the ones that were given this vision, but our job is to make sure that we are in alignment and bringing community along. But we are also facing a large amount of apathy in our community of people who are accustomed to not being heard or respected or their views um, listened to by elected officials or the like. And so their faith in the fact that we could actually make a difference or have that collective control is a challenge. But what we try to do is by making sure that we do, when we can, compensate people for their time, letting we know that we value their opinion. When we're at decision-making tables, we're never there alone. We are bringing our neighbors with us. We are making sure that if I meet a new technical advisor or a new potential investor, you're meeting them as well. So we don't gatekeep access. And some of those things we hope will have the effect of making sure that we're having the, the intentional outcomes that we're looking for of rural equity and bringing people to the table. And, but it is the groundwork, like what are your needs? How can I help you support the neighbors that come to you for advice? If I know, like, here's a contact for this city agency person who will be able to resolve that other problem that may not have anything to do with the work that I'm interested in, but I'm building trust with you because I'm making that bridge for you, then that helps us to kind of stem the tide of some of the, the, the doubt and fear, which is legitimate to have in our work. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, do you want to? Yeah, I think um, uh, for us, the, the, the challenge is about the, we, we based on the saving group, right? The growing of the project is uh, extend because the, the saving group that need the house. And when it's more extend, the demand is need, right? And uh, the thing that uh, the, the challenge is the continuity of the saving group that uh, meet to build a trust. Because uh, when I, uh, I haven't finished yet because of to, to make it scale, yeah, uh, you need uh, there are another community that wait, and some uh, some case the when the people are collect the money without the bank system, sometimes is uh, corrupt. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is the the gap between the informal uh, process way of working and the design process that we uh, to bridge. The, the gap between informal world, but with the conventional uh, world as a, the policy that we want to negotiate. I think this is the big gap in reality in our context. So, yeah. Yes, I will, uh, I will uh, use um, a sentence from Alison. <laughs> we are nothing uh, without uh, partnerships. And this, I think this is the, biggest lesson that is, 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 is not obvious, but uh, is uh, really important, even in the local scale, but when we develop a process that has to connect local and, and, and the institutional capacity. So after 15 or 20 years, some of the pro some, uh, uh, with some of the processes of uh, Medellin, for us and for me, it's, it's, really, it's really clear that uh, those that we and the people and the, the groups design with a more uh, robust and complex and diverse uh, agenda from the beginning, 
and some of them that uh, belongs to histories that uh, came from before. Not only was uh, were an idea from the government that this intelligence to map the reality of the places and to increase and to connect the processes that are happening and to elevate, to increase the capacity of those processes uh, are really important. And today, for example, the Moravia Cultural Center, even the Botanical Garden, but the, the, the initiatives of Moravia and so on and other uh, examples uh, are really powerful to have the capacity to build continuity even with uh, governments that are against them and trying to destroy them. So I am talking about some buildings, but not about the buildings, about the process and the institution and the design, how those programs happen in those spaces. And um, the, the, another idea is that, um, so we, have, we still have the same, not the same, but we still have very big problems in Medellin about violence, housing, uh, housing, uh, social housing uh, um, deficit, uh, but one real thing that is happening in Medellin today is that the accessibility and the dimension of the city uh, in relation of the mobility and the conversations is, is, is uh, bigger and is more uh, close, is closer to the reality, to the real city. Uh, so these uh, library, library centers, cultural centers, cable cars, and cultural programming in, in, the, in the whole city increase the transparency and increase this power of, uh, to develop uh, cross dialogues. And I think it's the starting point to improve. We didn't have the solutions. <laughs> But the conversation today is more real between the, low, uh, rea the local reality and the other places of the city. So how do you evaluate um, if just process leads to just outcomes and if the benefits are distributed justly? And I actually think there is a pretty strong relationship between the authenticity and the justice of your process and its uh, relationship to just outcomes. And I, I think that's because of something that you were talking about. When, when the process is truly just, meaning the decision-making power is shared, that there's not gatekeeping, that um, individuals or community groups are building their own power through this process, then they retain that power to ensure that the outcomes reflect the process. Um, and in our work, we try to, to uh, support that idea by how we choose projects. So oftentimes, um, groups will approach us, or even city agencies will approach us to just to only lead a, a, a process, a, a just process. And those, th that's work that we say no to, because if you don't also have the ability to ensure the just outcome, or if you don't also have, let's say, scope in the design and build or in the policy implementation, then it's very hard to ensure that the two are connected. But if, but if you can ensure that they're connected through the way that you write a scope or through the way that you set up your role in a project, and then you can ensure that you do truly succeed in building that community power along the way, those residents are there. I can think of several projects in which we've sort of gone away or gone on to another project in the same community, but the resident leaders are still there that have built the project. And they are the most capable of ensuring that the outcome is just at the beginning and it stays just over time because outcomes change. And I can think of really simple projects like small kind of semi-permanent public spaces in an informal settlement in Nairobi that as the settlement uh, began to develop in different ways or different political pressures uh, began to exert themselves in the settlement, uh, some of these semi-permanent sites that were built through a community process became under, came under threat 
threat of demolition or threat of evolution. And in every case, it was that community partner that had gone through this just process to create the space that was the only defense that that project had against um, ensuring that it remained uh, providing just an, a just outcome or continue to provide benefits for the community. So I, I do think there's a connection, it can be. Thank you. Um, so Joseph, he had to leave because he had to go to Boston to be in time to bring his daughter um, to daycare tomorrow morning, but he did email me a question uh, <laughs> just now, uh, which I, I will read. So this is from, from Joseph Henry. Um, um, so thank you all very much for your presentations. My intervention is interested in your reflections on how to better edify and communicate the collective protocols that are embedded in your work. I feel like we need to find approaches of not being reliant on exceptional individuals to try collective change in the built environment, or how do we tap into the everyday exceptionalism of people through sharing collective protocols as forms of public knowledge? I'm thinking about how to make these processes and projects more resilient in the long term. In my experience, particularly working for the mayor of London and trying to fund community-led initiatives, many collectives-based projects become reliant on the knowledge of individuals, which can be disrupted through many different life factors, death, divorce, boredom, etc. <laughs> Um, what ways, so I guess this is specifically the question, what ways have you managed to develop, communicate, and share collective protocols to help share specific methods and tools to others? Or will there uh, forever be a tension between collective action and individual exceptional leadership? So it touches on some of the things that were said already. So, Super, would you want to, okay. to take uh, on the, the tools since you had all these incredible tools yeah, that you shared? Yeah. Uh, as part of we uh, work in the network in Asia, and at the time, we, uh, every three months, we get together to create the, the mock workshop amongst the each country, because each country in Asia, they have political difference. And when once we bring the community leaders, saving group, uh, to learn another uh, context, actual uh, project that has been going on, I think this is the way to empower them and the way to communicate and exchange the knowledge uh, in the different, uh, how can I say, when they say, when they visit the another country, they also share what they had been doing and they also learn from another context. And when once they come back into their own country, they have, I think, um, they have a new perspective and the accumulated knowledge in the network are, are developed. And especially the uh, community architect in the network also from learn from the other country context, political, physical, and cultures. This is the way how we can uh, extend and ensure that uh, the production of knowledge that we've been created in the network uh, keep continuing going. Yep, thank you. Anybody else wants to, to take that question? Okay. I, I think that tension will always exist because ultimately I feel like we, in our work, we try to have, we're working on basically a community manifesto and it in part um, borrows from like black space has a manifesto. I think that it really speaks to um, the culturally relevant needs of like moving at the speed of trust and like centering black joy in those concepts that have real resonance. but the everyday realities of real estate and those pressures require people to make decisions and sometimes quickly and sometimes you can't wait for the entire community to weigh in on like whether or not we move. So it's that building of alignment and trust that allows community to say, okay, these certain people, we can allow them when necessary to move and because we have that relationship, that deep relationship of trust and understanding about what the values are collectively. But I, I, this is one of the things that I think about just in the community land trust movement itself about um, collective space is that it does ultimately rely on the realities that in some organizations, it's like really three people who do all the work and everyone else comes to hear about the work you did. But <laughs> how do we like work on getting, that's why we try to do a lot of intergenerational work. So if you're grooming people from there to always be involved, to feel that they always had a space at that decision-making table, that they're more likely over time 
to stay at the decision making table and to be invested. Maybe this is a good moment also in the interest of time. I, I would like if, if there's any questions from the audience also to, to give the to have the opportunity to, to ask questions. Um, so I would like to open it up. There's a microphone with the MAs. Any anybody has a question? Could I, could I say yes, something? please, please, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so related with the, the, the question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, th this um, uh, this capacity to to have uh, the um, the language that we need to talk with the different publics mm -hmm. is really important because. Um, if you have to develop a process with institutions, if you have to develop a process with social organizations, if we have to develop a process with uh, community and people, uh, it depends the the, peop the places where the people live as well. So, and doing with with respect, and uh, as well that has interest for both sides, not my perspective, is a challenge. But it's really important. So we, it's important to learn. I am not only talking about uh, words, talking about drawings, talking about technical information, talking about videos. So it's really, in terms of generation, it's difficult as well. Because if you are working with kids or young generations, uh, they have a, a different uh, interest, fresh. Uh, dance, uh, concerts, uh, meetings, and <laughs> so. So this is really important, and it's important to develop this capacity to design processes, pro projects, and spaces, and language, and communication that could uh, connect with respect and pertinence. So, um, and the most, for me, the most powerful a tool to communicate the, of, of communication is the people people itself so the people that belongs to those processes uh, in uh, in a more organic way mm -hmm. uh, yeah this is <clears throat> then the closing okay go ahead i think there is a question oh, there is a question sorry ah, uh, well yeah. I, I don't know if it's a question uh, uh, i want to first comment uh, everyone for the contributions this is incredibly helpful for in a place like a school of architecture. And I agree with Alejandro that uh, universities and schools have a huge uh, capacity to establish processes and give them durability. And in a way, my question, uh, and it's, it's more of a comment also, and goes back to, to Erica's uh, comment on how to evaluate uh, impact and how to evaluate basically uh, the, the achievements in the terrain of justice uh, to a process like this, it's uh, also what is the political capacity of a process like this and how different and detached are the politics that you're working with uh, with those of the electoral uh, uh, periods, uh, the four uh, years uh, elections in many countries or in many cities and how to make that, how to couple basically the, the, the times of the politics of design with the times of the politics of basically officials, public elected officials. I think Alejandro mentioned that a little bit, how to, to go beyond the four year period, but in each of your cases, you're dealing with that. And I, I, I would extend also to other infrastructure, other kind of frames. For instance, uh, uh, your work uh, was actually amazing, Alison, on how to work with economy and financial networks and, uh, and or frames that would allow also for an empowerment that, and a form of dissidence to financial hegemonies. But again, that has its own cycles. And there was, and then for instance, your, your, your work was also talking about the cycles of loans. And so how to couple the process of design with both electoral periods uh, so that you can basically attend uh, or, 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 or pay attention to the, the time that is needed for a process like this, and also with financial cycles. Because I guess that's where a big part of the design of what you're doing is, and a big challenge of that. But that, that's a way also to say that what we're learning today is that design means an action to the built environment means something very different here. It's a different way of 
uh, built, which is built in trust and, and, and enrollment and, and collective action, but also how to couple with time in a way that time, you, the time of design, the time of transformation, the time of impact uh, for justice, as Erica was putting it, is compatible and is coupled with the time of electoral periods and financial and loans uh, uh, returns and, and calendars. Thanks for the question. I, we're structured as a nonprofit firm and um, something I'm thinking about a lot uh, for an uh, upcoming conversation that I'll be having is how to do this, the kind of work that we've all been talking about tonight. You really, you can't be on a typical um, project timeline because it does take weathering multiple political cycles, changes in market forces, and a, a typical design process that starts at an RFP and is supposed to kind of move straight through to a project doesn't really accommodate that. Um, so what I would say is you, you have to redefine the, the project process and, and from the beginning, and then you have to redefine the way that it's funded, the way that it's resourced with both kind of political power and community power. And then I think it gets back to something Alejandro was saying was about messaging. What I see in our projects, I, I feel like almost all of our projects, except the ones that we do through RFPs, take five, eight, 10 years to really move from defining the need to building a project, to funding it, to changing policy, and then getting it built. And what I find is through that process, it's all, political cycles happen, market changes happen, and the project stays the same, the goal stays the same, but you have to change the message. Uh, and you just have to really talk, you have to find ways to talk about the exact same project, the exact same set of needs, in a totally different way because now your audience needs it framed differently or they need it, they need to understand it in the context of current priorities or current financial positions. So I think the ability to communicate drawings, words, um, videos, et cetera, becomes really key to weathering those cycles and weathering those changes. And then just being able to extend a project timeline and resource an extended timeline for a project um, is the other piece. Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, we have been working and I have I've been working with uh, an exceptional condition in Medellin 20, 15 years ago because we have uh, this deep crisis uh, a momentum of national situation, resources, civic leaders. <laughs> so some things happen. It's important to understand the, the momentum that allowed to develop a big transformation with a, co a very complex combination of resources and municipal capacity. And, and one thing that happens was this moment of confidence, of trust between the private sector, academy, government, but if we didn't have a, the crisis, I haven't been, I haven't been, <laughs> been here. So it's, this is the reality. So we, from that, I realized I've been trying to work and working with different cities and academy and centers, and I realized that I, I, did, I couldn't repeat, of course, the process. And, uh, and uh, this combination of things are difficult. So we, from that, we, 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 we have been working how to wo not to work with this exceptional condition. Mm -hmm. How to understand some principles, to understand some knowledge that we learned from the, some specific uh, projects and programs that is difficult to, to develop uh, uh, in this, simultaneously, all of them, uh, we did in some way, in, in some places. And uh, this understanding is really important because every reality is different. So this capacity of ad ad adapt 
and develop a dynamic uh, re, uh, process that could transform and we could change in the, in the, in the that appear uh, institution that have uh, resources of the right leader that you didn't expect from the beginning, or you could uh, try to work with the housing program, but in this process you have the, that the capacity of the env environmental uh, uh, secretary is really powerful that connect with some local, some local uh, a, a group of initiative is important. So this, this capacity to, to adapt and to understand and to design not one agenda one in, 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 in the process to design different levels of, of, of uh, processes or, or, or agendas uh, is important. Uh, um, yes, this. I wants I'll to just, take it or I would just say it, yep. it it's always going to be a challenge you're especially with I can tell you from my experience with elected officials you are managing relationships and some of them seem to require more personal connection than sometimes can overshadow the bigger goals so you have to kind of know what their needs are but I think it's partly the continuation of building that deep relationship where I have the information about your constituents and the things that they are find most important because I'm engaging with the people who are most civically engaged, who are most likely to vote. And they're voting based on whether or not you can, are participating in these projects if you are seeing the, you know, the importance of them. And we're basically creating a resource data for you to know what your, the needs are. And it, it definitely is a challenge over time where especially when we're calling for community engagement. And I think, at least from my experience, city agencies have a very finite period. It's essentially, well, we went to the community board and we did a presentation there, so that was the community engagement. But most of the people in the community do not attend the community board meetings. So therefore, you're not really engaging the community to the levels that you really think that you are or want to. So it's organizations and just block associations, all those people gathering together to help broaden out their reach that can help stem the tide of the fact that we have short spans of time to get projects going. But if we can help them maximize their capacity to actually reach more people to get that buy-in, then that's where we have a chance to really make a difference that really doesn't get as much pushback on the back end. Mark, Mark could you add one idea? Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, trying to contribute to your question, uh, uh, talking about officials. Um, so um, when you, you have a good uh, government <laughs> and the possibility to work with or institutional uh, initiatives as well. So I think uh, if you have a, 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 an initiative, a program and a project that you built, uh, not only from academy, or from the community, or from different outside from the government. Uh, so it's important that, that you understand very well the, 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 re, the real conditions of this person that are leading the process in the government. So the time, the, the schedule, and their narrative or their approach. So and uh, I think and and how. To, to, it's important to have this capacity to modify and to adapt your specific program or project that it could develop in an, I, I don't know if an hybrid condition that match the time and the schedule of this person, of this institution, and as, of course, how you could add your, your, your principles and your approach as well. But we have to be flexible. And to and to trying to understand, not to keep your project clean, is to adapt. Yeah. <clears throat> and the last response of this summit, super. Yeah, please. Yeah. To answer your question, uh, normally the housing projects for the poor is uh, is a political tool for the local politician, right? Uh, if you are the poor, you have to wait for the land, wait for the housing projects. But for our work, we try to. Uh, with the saving group, this is power and uh, the pilot projects and revolving fund. And when it's time is take uh, two, and the pro project are uh, growing up 
and the member of saving, uh, saving group are increasing. And I think this is the, the power for negotiate the, 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 the land and uh, negotiate for the support fund from the infrastructure. I think the, the way is how, how we use the politics. We not avoid the politics, but with the network of the people and the resort and the project that they have on hand, they can negotiate the, with the land, uh, with the government, uh, through the politics. I think this is the, 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 the way that we learn and how we play with the politics, with the people. Well, thank you, everyone. It was amazing to hear all these projects together. Thank you so much. And, and we, hope, we hope to see many of you um, again for the next summit, which will be September 30th, with um, Adekolao, Renato Simbalista, Carlos Baiges, uh, and Barika Williams um, from ANHD, who uh, will discuss affordable housing in this very room again. Okay, see you.